Jack and I are delighted to have the opportunity to present on the topic of dating scams and fraud. We're both senior associates at Edmunds Marshall McMahon, uh, which is a central London law firm specialising in, amongst other things, white collar crime and private prosecutions. My background uh, is as a senior lawyer at the Serious Fraud Office uh, in London, having been part of a small team focused on the investigation and prosecution of Rolls-Royce employees arising from the bribery and corruption allegations. And prior to that, uh, as you may gauge from my accent, um, I worked as a litigation lawyer in New Zealand for a number of years. Jack is a barrister and has been at Edmunds Marshall McMahon since 2015 uh, as in-house counsel advising clients and within the firm on legal issues and developments within our fields of practice. So today we're going to cover a number of areas which we hope will be of use to criminal lawyers advising their clients when it comes to frauds and uh, more specifically uh, on dating or romance frauds. So firstly, we'll run through the typical ingredients of a dating fraud and look at some recent case law surrounding dating fraud, including the infamous uh, Tinder swindler. We'll then look at some of the remedies available to victims of dating scams, including the obligations owed by banks when it comes to victims. We'll then look at the provisions of the recently enacted Contingent Reimbursement Model Code for Authorised Push Payment Scams, a bit of a mouthful, uh, which most major banks are now signed up to and what this means for victims. Uh, and we'll also cover the broader implied duty owed by banks to exercise reasonable care and skill when executing customers' instructions. This is termed the Quince Care duty. And finally, we'll briefly touch on the law of private prosecutions, uh, often a lesser known, but nonetheless effective remedy available to victims. The Tinder swindler. This is perhaps the most high profile example of dating fraud, otherwise known as romance fraud. It's an atypical example in that Simon Leviev didn't appear to accrue wealth from the fraud, but with the victim's money, managed to live a lifestyle he could not otherwise afford. The purpose of the fraud was no comfort to the victims, who were women that he charmed and deceived. They were still defrauded. In fact, the total losses to his victims across Europe are estimated to be around $10 million dollars. 